Good morning. I'm Mustafa Al-Rawi, Assistant Editor-in-Chief at The National. Thank you for joining us for this session titled Boosting Vaccine Confidence. It's an exclusive expert panel. We're going to do a briefing on the global implications of the COVID-19 crisis and the road ahead. We are on the cusp of an era of mass COVID-19 inoculation. The deployment of vaccines by drug makers such as Pfizer-BioNTech, AstraZeneca, Moderna, Sinopharm and the Gamaleya Center promises to put the pandemic behind us. Justifiably, there's been plenty of optimism about a return to a more normal arc of life. However, it may not be a straight line to global herd immunity. Surveys indicate that only 73% of people would get a COVID-19 vaccine if available, with the number as low as 40% in some countries. It would seem that there is a lot more work to be done to help people feel comfortable enough to get a jab. So we're going to discuss the various aspects of this about confidence with our experts, as I said. Um, with us is uh, Heidi Larson, Professor of Anthropology, Risk and Decision Science at the London School of Hygiene and tropical medicine. She's also the director of the Vaccine Confidence Project. We also have from Singapore, Professor Cho Chuan Tan. He's executive director of the Office for Healthcare Transformation at the Ministry of Health there. He's also Singapore's first chief health scientist. Welcome to both of you. Um, so, uh, Professor Larson, perhaps I could, I could start with you. Um, good morning, first of all, and, uh, and, and also to say that uh, you recently have published a book called Stuck that discusses the issues of trust and distrust around vaccines. How do we work on, on building the trust that's needed to get enough people uh, to come forward and take the vaccine so that we can get to that sort of magical uh, herd immunity that we've been talking about? Well, trust is all about relationships. I mean, it's very relational. Um, and I think that um, in general, most of trust is generally defined most deeply in the philosophical literature, and it's two things. It's about trust in the ability um, if, if you believe the, your doctor or your politician or your healthcare, um, local, local healthcare worker or system um, is competent. And the other uh, domain of it is motive. Uh, and I think what's particularly concerning in some of the challenges that we face now is that a lot of people do, don't trust by default rather than by, um, I mean, I grew up with trust as the default, <laughs> but the world is, is not um, like that in many settings. So it's, it's really, uh, and I think what's happened in the context of COVID uh, is it's thrown even more uncertainty. And, and you trust, as we all know, the old adage goes, it takes a long time to build and you can lose it pretty quickly. So um, I think that, uh, and this is, uh, the COVID and the pandemic is no longer quick. <laughs> it's been a long haul already. And we've got this very mixed um, news of uh, vaccines coming down the pipeline, but then this whole new portfolio of variants, which is adding more uncertainty, and we have a, a lot of supply issues. And as anyone who's read the news, and Ben will talk about it, a very, um, a very uneven landscape of public confidence. Can I just pick up on that point that we're in an atmosphere of, of, of kind of beginning from the point of, of not having trust? Is, is this a new phenomenon? Uh, is it, how long has it been that we, when did we exactly move from starting from a basis of trust to moving to, to where we are now? Well, um, it's interesting. I think his, humankind has gone through eras and histories of it. I think if you go back to even the terms misinformation, go back to uh, the First and Second World War, we have old etchings um, in the Welcome Trust here in the archives that go back to the very early days of vaccines. But in the context of wars in particular, 
the notion of fake news to to deter to send the enemy in the wrong direction is very old um but i think uh we're back there in one of the low points in history and certainly wef wef has been monitoring or the the with the edelman trust barometer for years and i think last year was the lowest in the in the period that they've been monitoring and we see that in the vaccine confidence um index it's very correlated with trust or lack of trust to government i hope i see covid as a huge opportunity for publics uh for for governments to rebuild trust because it's highly related i mean if we can come out of this with publics having a different appreciation of their governments we could shift the whole trust landscape if they feel like they've been let down and betrayed broken uh it's going to be we're going to have to start from scratch again and mustafa i don't know whether i can just chip in here uh please say that uh, the situation is uh, variegated across the globe and uh, if you look at uh, some of the countries in uh, east asia for example uh there is the indications that i think uh, trust levels there uh, in public health authorities uh, in government uh, maybe higher and uh, this uh, i think uh, is uh, somewhat correlated with uh, the ability of the society to respond to the pandemic uh, and i think as heidi says uh, a trust is something that needs to be built up uh, over the long term and uh, the best time to build trust is uh, between pandemics uh, but the pandemic requires us uh, to find new ways to build trust even uh, during a crisis period and uh, this this i think would be a major opportunity for us to see if we can uh, address the situation before that and maybe the final point i'll make is uh, that it also reflects to some extent uh, how cohesive or polarized societies are uh, prior to the pandemic uh, because the pandemic is uh, exacerbating and um, making much more prominent uh, the different aspects of society uh, that have existed before Thanks Professor Tan. I I'd, I'd like to come back to you in a moment uh, if if I can to discuss the experience you've had in a, a practical level in Singapore because there is a a real diversity in experiences in terms of public health crisis depending on which part of the world you're in. Uh but first I'd like to introduce um Ben Page who's the chief executive of Ipsos Mori. Welcome Ben. Good morning. Good morning. Um you you kind of going to be able to serve our hypothesis today that we we've got a problem with trust. um um when it comes to the vaccine correct well we do although actually i have some positive news and i think that is as we start to see millions of people vaccinated uh what we're seeing in the data is that during 2020 as uh, scores of teams all over the world rushed to produce vaccines we saw a decline in vaccine confidence in our global trends survey but what we've now seen actually uh, since december as we've actually started vaccination programs is many more people now saying they will take the vaccine because of course if you know that in my country 6 million people have now had it and there haven't been new stories of massive side effects we're actually now starting to see um considerable rises in the proportion who say they're willing to take it we're certainly not clear of trouble and there is a trust problem although i don't think it's new it's uh, it's perennial it's been here for decades but there are i think there are some positive signs so that's that's to me is really encouraging there's still of course massive regional and national differences in the proportion who say they'll take it with you know countries like France and Russia very very low and of course both have you know all sorts of challenges but interestingly places like Britain Brazil China are much more in, much more enthusiasm but everywhere since December we've seen a rise in um the proportion who say that they'll take it so i think as long as there aren't stories about side effects breaking out across the world's media um i think we may assuming we can get the distribution to work we may be you know starting to turn the corner on this but i absolutely agree with previous speakers that the trust challenge is there there is a big gap between those who say they trust their government and those who don't in terms of willingness to take it and that of course is also related to your likelihood to engage in conspiracy theories and all sorts of other stuff so trust in government absolutely matters but we mustn't over overdo the trust problem because it's been around for decades and as Heidi has just said 
if we can successfully deliver this, this may actually help build trust. Thank you there. Um, I, I mean, I would, I would suggest that we can also be in danger of being overly confident, right? Because the situation is so fluid that, you know, trust will ebb and flow as we go along. And, and also uh, to say that we talk about the problem being there for decades, but also we have recent experience um, this century with, with SARS and other um, uh, outbreaks that, that may inform uh, what we need to do. I mean, Professor Larson, you, you, you had firsthand experience uh, when, it, when it came to those, those problems. Yes, um, this is a, I like the, the, the looking at it in a fluidity ebb and flow point of view. And we have learned, learned a lot from previous um, uh, experiences. I mean, when you think back to H1N1, um, the biggest challenge for people accepting vaccines uh, was that they were too new. And that, you know, that was a virus that we knew a lot. I mean, we were familiar with. It was around since, uh, you know, 1918. I mean, the character, you know, these things evolve. But, I mean, that particular strain was not a brand new strain. The flu vaccine was a very common uh, preparation. It's just we needed to add that strain because it came into circulation later, but still it was the newness. And one of the phenomena with uh, the new vaccines is they're, they're brand, we've got a brand new virus we're still running to catch up with and figure out. Um, we've got a whole new ways of making vaccines. Part of the reason they um, uh, were so fast, that was the other anxiety, is that uh, they're able to be faster. And we haven't talked enough about the, the new technologies that have made this possible possible. So some of these things are historic. Even the rumors about uh, eight, um, COVID being caused by 5G. In H1N1, it was 4G. In SARS, it was 3G. I mean, these things are rumors uh, like I write about in, in Stuck, my book. Um, they kind of, they're there. They, they occur when the fertile ground allows them and then they sleep, they hibernate, but then they're back when the moment is there. And this is, this is a, a ripe, a fertile moment for <laughs> these kind of things. But I agree with Ben. Um, there is an overall, uh, I would say slight, Ben, I would caution that with slight, uh, but the, the problem is that there's pockets um, of like health workers, we're very concerned about health workers, and marginalized groups that are still lagging behind, but I, I, I let, I'll keep with the positive, positive momentum and hope that keeps going. <laughs> uh, it, it's a complex uh, issue because if, if Professor Tan, the experience of Singapore it's at times been a model for how you, you handle public health crisis. There's some suggestion now that the, the risk towards getting more people vaccinated is that people are overconfident, that they, they feel there's no urgency because of how well the government's handled it. So does trust, you don't want too much trust, so to speak. Well, uh, I will say in Singapore, we have a healthy paranoia about not being uh, complacent about the COVID pandemic and we are, despite uh, the quite quiet situation, taking many steps to prevent new outbreaks. Uh, having said that, I think it's true that uh, the well-controlled situation uh, here uh, can contribute to vaccine hesitancy. So in Singapore, um, uh, the COVID situation has been quiet uh, for some months now. We had uh, 15 local cases in the past seven days. And if you travel around Singapore, things feel pretty normal, except everyone is wearing a mask and we still observe safe distancing practices. Uh, there are people in Singapore who worry about the safety of new vaccines, as uh, Heidi mentioned. And uh, of course, Singapore uh, is as exposed to fake vaccine news and misinformation as everyone else. Uh, but uh, it hasn't, uh, fortunately, it hasn't turned out to be a significant problem so far for our vaccination rollout. And uh, if I may, uh, Mustafa, I just mentioned uh, three uh, things that we have been doing uh, as part of this. First, uh, as Heidi says, um, a very extensive public engagement program uh, with uh, multi-channels being used through experts, through community leaders, through peers. Uh, in fact, it will also include a door-to-door -door, uh, element uh, for older people to explain the vaccine to them. 
Uh, in parallel, we run uh, very extensive uh, webinars and meetings with physicians and healthcare workers uh, to make sure that uh, they are up to date about how uh, we are approaching vaccinations, safety, and so on. And when we uh, see fake news, we try to call it out and correct it. Uh, second, um, because there is uh, very little uh, local transmission, we can roll out vaccination to priority groups in an overlapping manner. Uh, so we started healthcare workers and frontline responders in early January. Uh, we have started uh, essential workers in uh, late January, and we will be starting the elderly uh, from end January. So this allows uh, those who are ready in each priority group to come forward to take up the vaccine, uh, while allowing us to keep up a uh, good overall pace of vaccination. And uh, as Ben says, uh, over time, we expect that as more and more people get safely vaccinated, uh, you know, there will be rising confidence among society and we expect that the take-up rates will then uh, start to uh, increase quite sharply. And finally, uh, we took uh, a number of weeks, a uh, couple of weeks to ensure that the processes and systems for vaccination were working well because we want vaccination to be as convenient and as hassle-free as possible. Uh, and uh, this means that uh, everyone comes by invitation. Uh, we have a range of options, uh, big high throughput vaccine centers, many uh, GPs and polyclinics, and also mobile teams. Uh, we uh, provide information before vaccines and we remind people to turn up uh, for their second shots. Uh, so I think complacency is uh, a real danger, I agree. Uh, and we are taking uh, the measures that we can in Singapore uh, to try to prevent that from getting in the way of uh, a fast and efficient vaccine rollout while allowing people to, to choose if they want to have the vaccine or not. It's good to link the, the, the point of convenience with, with confidence that, that they are interlinked um, and, and also trust as well. It, it, they all go hand in hand. Uh, but also to make the point you know, to the audience out there that we're not saying that if somebody is hesitant about the vaccine that somehow they are a crank or a conspiracy theorist or an anti-vaxxer. Um, vaccine hesitancy is, is, is real and normal and, and I think we're just trying to have a discussion, a frank discussion about it. And, and you mentioned fake news. Um, you know, I'm in the news business and there's enough real news that can create um, that, that anxiety and that hesitancy. For example, that these new uh, variants of the virus, whether the South African variant or the UK variant, I mean, how does that change change the discussion? Ben Page, if I can come back to you to kind of say, you know, you, you have to keep plugging in more, you know, more factors to your model, right, when you're trying to work out what people are thinking. Yes, well, I think, I mean, the new variant, of course, has, uh, you know, raised concern all over the world. I think, the, but, but act, to be honest, what we've seen is that the public's generally, their attitudes from being very alarmed as the vaccine, as, as the disease rolled out, hasn't really shifted in a sense that levels of concern have stayed high throughout. So people, uh, what we're seeing globally is that people recognise a clear and present danger when they see it, talking about populations as a whole, and the new variants in one sense just sharpen that. And therefore, there is willingness to do what it takes. And I think in an age of social media, it's the risk is that we pay so much attention to the loudest voices, often you know, on social media amplified by the way that the algorithms work, that we sometimes forget about the silent majority who are not ranting on social media and you know social media does have a key you know a key role in all of this because if you are concerned about the vaccine or indeed even susceptible to uh, a conspiracy theory we're finding that's much higher among people who use uh, platforms like youtube or facebook for their news there's a very strong correlation in believing um, 
you know, that there are problems uh, or con even conspiracy theories with heavy use of social media. So there's a real responsibility on those platforms to manage themselves effectively. And we won't go into the rights and wrongs of, of uh, social media regulation. But I would say that our polling globally sh shows an average in across the world of 78 percent wanting uh, it, it more regulated. But I think overall what our work shows looking at individual governments is that those that are consistent, that communicate communicate regularly, um, do far better than, you know, people who are inconsistent and who c continually change the goalposts. So there's some messages there for people listening who are in the role of government communications as well. There's a big difference by countries according to how, you know, consistent uh, in terms of their messaging the government has been. So, Professor Larson, you're the head of a, the Vaccine Confidence Project. So how do you tackle the, the medium of, of, of social media? Well, um, I actually work pretty closely with or collaborate pretty closely with Facebook and, and some of the other platforms. It's not so straightforward. Um, it, it's not like the world is divided into into fake and real news. Uh, there's a lot of hugely ambiguous uh, information and the um, the extreme, the people who whose motive, getting back to the trust definition, uh, the people whose motive is to disrupt and is not about anxiety about vaccines, um, are getting quite clever in the sense of they see, they know about the regulations, it's all out there. Um, so they, they're turning their statements into questions. They're seeding doubt. They're seeding um, a whole... Uh, Uns more uncertainty. They're endorsing people's concerns. And that kind of thing is very hard to delete. It's not, you know, overt fact. If, it, if you have something that says drink a, a quart of chloroquine to cure COVID, that if I, as Facebook, I can say that's overtly harmful take it down. Um, but there's a lot of ambiguous, which makes it challenging. I'm not apologizing for the fact that, you know, more can be done, uh, but it's not so straightforward. And I think in addition to the silent majority who are, I would call them in political sense, you've got your base, you've got your swing vote, and you've got your um, the opposition, which some of which is highly organized and disruptive, but that swing vote is much bigger these days than it has been historically. And part of the reason, I'm sorry to say, is that we haven't, we have taken for granted, we have been focusing as a public health community too comfortably on the, the base and not taking the questioners uh, seriously enough. And too many of them are slipping to the opposition because the opposition is listening. They're listening, they're endorsing their concerns. They say, we care. They have, if there are a hundred of them, they'll have 10 different groups for everybody's different concerns. The base is monotone, same message all the time, take that vaccine, take that vaccine. Um, and we haven't done enough in the middle. And that's where we need to move. Professor Tan, uh, do you have any thoughts on, on, on that in terms of the policy? Yes, uh, so I agree with what Heidi says, and I think we need uh, many different channels to reach out to different people. So in uh, Singapore, for example, for the elderly, uh, you know, we need uh, people who speak uh, the native dialects uh, with whom people can relate uh, to go and talk to them. So we can do that in Singapore because it's a small place, it's a compact city, but it's necessary because we can't expect uh, people who are older, maybe not as uh, well-versed in English, to uh, just read uh, materials that are sent out through the internet. Uh, so we need multiple channels to reach out to different groups, to understand what are their real concerns, and uh, to address them uh, as they are. And for the elderly, they could include things like, uh, how do I get to the vaccine center? Uh, will it be safe? Uh, you know, will, it be, uh, will there be people that look after me? Uh, so it has got to be something holistic, I think, that uh, once uh, enough people have experienced uh, it, the vaccination and found it to be uh, smooth, easy, and um, for themselves, and they start to relate it to uh, their peers in the community. I think that's where you can get much greater traction. Ben, you want to come in there? 
Well, I, I think it's a, another example of something that we have seen in all sorts of societies over the last decade, indeed, since the crash, which is the the need to understand the role of emotion in communications. And we've seen it in so many ways in, in numerous elections and political events around the world that the people in charge, the scientists, the economists, the, the, the rational people, uh, the empirical people, just assume that you tell people the evidence, the scientific truth, um, and after all, the evidence is that globally, scientists are the most trusted profession by far. You tell people the facts uh, in a rational way and they will believe you. And I think what the evidence has been over the last uh, you know, two decades or more is that increasingly we need to use both emotion and fact to communicate. And that is uh, that that becomes really quite tricky, particularly when you're dealing with something like motivated ignorance. There are there are you know some there are lots of reasons for rational ignorance. You know ex there is, there's too much in stuff in the world to actually for any individual to actually understand. So you can't understand everything. But there's also motivated reasoning and just you know wanting to believe. You know if you look at some of the conspiracy theorists in the U.S., it's almost a, a closed world that you can retreat into. And when there is huge risk and uncertainty in the world, uh, and for many populations that is the reality of life in the 21st century, it, it can be quite appealing to have a theory that seems to explain everything because an evil conspiracy, you know, there's these people, somebody somewhere does actually know how it all works, and uh, you can retreat and actually into this. But once you're in that loop, it's, uh, telling people facts isn't going to get them out of it. So I think the more governments can understand that one needs both fact and emotion in communications, the more likely we are to be successful, because that's also what we're up against. Um, I mean, we've got five minutes left. There's there's so much more we could we could touch upon. Uh, I mean, at the moment, there's a lot of discussion over um, you know actually producing and distributing the vaccines. Whether we'll have delays, what what kind of supply shortages that could come up that obviously will impact confidence. We also have different ethnic groups in different countries have different attitudes, so we can't communicate with a with a one size fits all uh, approach. And then you know you talk Ben, you talk there about science and and prevent providing the facts, but you know, we, we currently have a lot of tension between the scientists and the policymakers, um, and e each is saying something quite different. For example, what gap there needs to be between the first vaccine jab and the second, there seems to be, you know, a, la a lack of agreement. Um, you know, since we've got a few minutes left, um, you know, I'll, I'll ask each of you to kind of just give us your, you know, your final, final thoughts. Um, if I could start with you, Professor Tan. Yeah, I think it's an important point, and uh, we, I think, um, uh, scientists um, uh, and uh, also policymakers have to try and bridge the gap uh, to uh, look at uncertainty of science. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainties, uh, but to translate them into practical approaches, practical solutions, and uh, a consistent way to communicate them. And uh, if we can do that uh, in a very consistent manner, and um, also in an open and transparent manner, uh, communicating through a variety of channels, understanding what uh, different groups are most concerned about. I think that helps uh, to uh, engender the open dialogue as well as the trust. And uh, that helps carry uh, us through situations, uh, sometimes where we may not have got it completely right, uh, but uh, it has uh, provides the basis for us to uh, continue to uh, deal with unpredictabilities of uh, this um, pan pandemic, which I think has still quite a number of twists and turns to come. Uh, Professor Larson? Well, I think um, uncertainty is the, I mean, we often talk about risk and uncertainty and, and risk and trust, um, coming back to our trust framing. And um, the more we can build trust, the the more uh, publics can, t um, your threshold for, for accepting risk is quite different. And risk is about uncertainty. Risk is about, you know, um, pretty much everything's uncertain in life, but the, some of it has different implications than others. And vaccines is certainly high on the list uh, 
in some people's perceptions. Um, and they're constantly weighing, I mean, we often talk in public health about the difference between benefit and risk, but the publics don't look at it that way. They're much more sensible. They're comparing risk and risk, risk of the disease, risk of the vaccine. Um, and um, so I think the external environment uh, with uncertainty, I think we do need to learn to navigate it. Um, and I, I think how people are guided through it um, during these times is is going to be complicated. Um, but uh, I think it can also have a bringing people together. I see the, what it's done for bringing local communities together. Uh, I'm in a city with long commuters, and they're not doing that now. And you, I think a lot of people are getting to know their neighbors like they didn't know them before. Ben Page, if I can give you the, uh, the last 30 seconds or so. Sure. I'd just say use stories and facts. Meet people where they are. Understand that they're, um, they're, 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 they're worried about risk. Human beings, however clever they are, tend to have weak abilities at juggling different sorts of probabilities of risk, to be quite honest. So tell people stories tell people the facts, but use and use trusted figures to do that. And, you know, we will get through this together. It's been amazing to have the vaccines ready so quickly. So that we, we know what to do, but there are no shortcuts. But inshallah, we'll get there. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Thank you to our experts. Goodbye.